Tonight, the Albanese government gets desperate and smears Peter Dutton as a defender of pedophiles. How low would this government go? Plus, why are taxpayers paying 125000 to these people, one's even an American, to teach public servants how to pay respects to traditional owners? And climate change minister Chris Bowen warns he might take even more people from Pacific Islands that he falsely believes are drowning. How gullible is this guy? And the truce between Israel and Hamas has been extended. I'll speak to one of America's top generals on why the war must go on. Actually, about that. Breaking news. Another terrorist attack on Israel. It's in Jerusalem. Two men, thought to be members of Hamas, jumped out of a car and started shooting at people at a bus stop. Civilians, of course. Two women killed by these heroes and a man in his 70s as well, according to the Times of Israel, and potentially as many as nine others injured. That is what Israel is fighting, that kind of bloodlust. Anyone dead will do, as long as they're Jewish. But to what I was going to talk about, which is related, there's a poem about a drunk who's singing there in the gutter with a pig, and it ends... Like this, a woman yelling at them. You can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses. At that, the pig got up and walked away. And I actually say to good people of the left, get up and walk away. Walk away from these disgusting pro-Palestinian protests that are now just fronts for the most wicked Jew hatred. Just walk away. Now, forgive the language, but look at these bastards. I mean, look at who you are giving cover to, that you are licensing. Last night, for instance, we have here in this country visiting Israelis on a delegation to beg for our help. They are mothers and sisters and brothers of Jews taken hostage or even killed nearly eight weeks ago by Hamas terrorists. But when they last night went back to their Melbourne hotel, pro-Palestinian ratbags followed them inside to intimidate these traumatised people. Now, one of the Jews they targeted said the group actually had to hide. He said, uh, I didn't think something like that would happen in Australia. But by God, we've changed. I mean, the shame of it. I'm seeing now overseas reports of this incident after they've already seen a pack of a mob of Jew haters outside the Sydney Opera House saying, gas the Jews. And now this, following Jews into a Melbourne hotel to do what? What a sick puppy you'd have to be to do that to these people who've suffered such, such loss already. Whatever side of the debate you are, this is a disgrace. How lacking in compassion, how tribal and thuggish. And I think the Prime Minister today said it very well. What we saw uh, last night in Melbourne at a hotel in Docklands goes beyond the right of people to peacefully protest in our democratic country. Why people would make the conscious decision to hold a protest where the families of these people were staying is beyond my comprehension. Beyond my comprehension and beyond contempt. What we are seeing is humanity just cast aside this kind of stuff we're seeing again and again, and for only one side of the debate. I think it's not an accident either, but a characteristic. Well, you take this Greens MP, Gabriel Di Vietri, who actually wore a Palestinian kefir to a Melbourne function run by Jews who were again pleading for the release of the hostages. That's unbelievable. I mean, what contempt for the grief of the Jews to come up to them in the colours of terrorists who slaughtered and enslaved their loved ones. What is going through your tiny mind? Now, Di Vietri says, well, I, I did take it off when I got inside. But she was wearing that scarf again in Parliament today, flaunting it in front of a Jewish MP, David Southwick. 
Now, the Greens are the people in the gutter here. Walk away. Get up and walk away from them. In Canberra, the Greens, of course, voted against condemning Hamas, even against condemning Hamas, the terrorist group which runs Gaza, which slaughtered 1,200 Jews on October 7, which committed mass rape against the women, beheaded men, took about 240 hostages, including this mother and her two children, one just 10 months old. And now Hamas is telling us, oh, dear me, uh, they died last week. Hamas blames Israeli bombs, that really, with its record, could just as easily slit their throats. And wasn't it telling us just, what, two days ago that, uh, oh, sorry, we actually uh, sold them, we actually passed them on to another terrorist group. Uh, now they're dead. Well, walk away from them. Walk away from the Greens. Walk away from the protests where the crowds are being coached into chanting for the destruction of all Israel. From the river to the sea goes the chant. And what of the Jews then? Walk away from them all. Walk away from the protesters now, even in our cities, are tagging Jewish homes. Kill the Jews. Jews live here. Or putting graffiti on businesses they think are too close to Israel and the Jews. This is one of the barbarians with a, look at that, a cross through the Jewish star of David. I mean, walk away from the Jew haters who now even paste anti-Israel stickers on food dips made and sold by Jews. I mean, just, just walk away from these people. I mean, how can you stand in a crowd that produces this kind of stuff, that encourages this kind of stuff and makes Australia look too much like Germany was under the Nazis in 1933 and after? Just walk away. And I wonder if these people, uh, like the sinister Greens, you know, showing off their own Palestinian scarves, or the silly little actors at the Sydney Theatre Company who ambush their audience, Jews and the audience too, with their own scarves at a curtain call on the weekend. I wonder if they actually understand these people, the brutality, the Palestinians running the territories that they are so nobly defending, like Gaza, like the West Bank. Now you take the last prisoner swap in this now six-day truce, seven it'll be, in the war in Gaza. Hamas releasing a few more hostages, women and children, in exchange for Palestinian prisoners, including terrorists. Now Hamas, even after making this deal, made their last batch of hostages walk through a mob in Gaza that was screaming abuse before they got to their ambulance. <laughs> What kind of people would do that kind of thing? And in the West Bank, the other day, <laughs> there should have been more reports about this. Palestinians cheering as terrorists there murdered, and warning, this is distressing, right? We've blurred some of it, but it's distressing. They hanged these two guys upside down, two men that they accused of helping Israel to fight a terrorist group that actually dominates a former refugee camp there. Allah, Allah, Allah. And then they cut off the legs of one of those guys. I mean, seriously, there is such a sick culture at work there. Can you imagine Israelis doing something like that and posting the footage up to brag about it? Can you? There is now a sick culture here too. What are the protesters here really supporting? Look at it. Now ask those progressives, so-called, who are marching in these crowds that are sort of licensing what we're seeing here. I asked the school children, what are you doing? You see the behaviour now that these Palestinian protests are encouraging here. The threats, the screams of abuse, the physical attacks now on Jews, the murder threats, the in-your-face vandalism, the intimidation, hunting Jews through hotels now. What are you doing? What are you doing? Walk away. Leave all that in the gutter with the greens. In, with the haters, with the bullies, and with these apologists for terror, just walk away. Well, Barnaby Joyce coming up next, because 
this has just been so crazy. We have had these, these attacks, right, on Peter Dutton being a friend, a defender of pedophiles. It's disgusting. Abusing him. Uh, what actually happened was this. You had, you had Peter Dutton and the, and the opposition saying no earlier this week to a law that the government wanted to rush through to cover its embarrassment, right? It had released more than 140 people from immigration detention, had to do because the High Court said so, release them without proper controls because it wasn't, it was asleep at the wheel. The government said, oh, look, we're going to patch this up. We're going to make it uh, a new law that says it's uh, illegal for these guys to stand in front of, say, a school because there are pedophiles in this group. And the government said, no. Oh, said Labor. Well, then you are defenders of pedophiles because... In fact, Dutton said, no, we want the laws tougher. That is the phony basis for Labor's disgusting smear that you've been hearing all week. La Dutton is a defender of pedophiles. Dutton's, in fact, amounted an apology now. I've arrested sex offenders before. It's one of my life's passions to make sure that women and kids are safe, uh, and I feel very genuinely and deeply about it. I, I think... Uh, I am owed an apology from Annika Wells and the Prime Minister, but we'll see if they're big enough to make that apology. To talk about that and other matters is our regular Thursday guest, Nationals front bencher Barnaby Joyce, the former Deputy Prime Minister, who's actually fresh from yet another protest. But this time it's in Sydney's Martin Place. Barnaby Joyce was there, a protest against those ugly wind farms that are now scarring our landscape. Barnaby Joyce, thank you so much for joining me. What was this protest you were at today? Well, it's yet another protest. We've had the Port Stephens. I spoke there, thousands there. We had the Illawarra. They had thousands down there. Um, we've had them in the New England. And now we had one in Martin Place. And it was basically getting people from central Queensland to the Illawarra, to Port Stephens from the New England, all these people who have had their rights completely and utterly uh, walked on by, and they're not, by not, wind, people call them wind farms, they're not wind farms. Farms grow carrots and spuds and peas and cattle. These are industrial wind factories, solar factories, transmission lines, overwhelmingly foreign owned, and it's the biggest swindle of all time. To think that these people are underwritten, underwritten like, you know, for well, possibly 16%, 15% by the taxpayer. I mean, they can do nothing and they just rip the taxpayer off and we're supposed to be happy about this. And I tell you what, people are not happy now. And if you look at where they are, Port Stephens, Illawarra, so you've got Patterson, you've got Hunter, you've got Newcastle, you've got Gilmore, you've got Whitlam, you've got Eden Monero, all these seats, they're all Labor seats. I mean, wake up. Mr. Bowen, wake up, Mr. Albanese. These are your own people protesting against you because they feel that they had their rights completely and utterly usurped. And I say to the listeners, on the 6th of February, the 6th of February at 10 a.m., we're coming to Canberra because Mr. Bowen doesn't seem to be able to hear us. But so we'll have to go a bit, a bit closer to him. Uh, well, I hope they're all solar-powered cars and buses that are driving all these people there. We shall see. But Barnaby, you know, what gets me is the Albanese government believes that any fake, well, believes any fake climate scare is good enough to uh, change even our immigration intake. I couldn't believe this. Here's the climate change minister today in Parliament saying we might have to take in more so-called climate refugees from the Pacific. Climate change is an existential national security risk to our Pacific partners. Nations most vulnerable to sea level rise are likely to look to Australia and other countries for closer economic integration, including through expanded circular labour mobility schemes and longer term options for mobility with dignity. In fact, Barnaby, even the ABC now admits that the vast majority of low-lying Pacific islands are growing or stable. They're not sinking at all. Yet this government's already agreed to take in 280 people a year from Tuvalu, which has also grown, not, not sunk. Should we take in more? Well, what we're si obviously, Andrew, what's happening? I'm happy for people to come in to work here. But on the premise, on this sort of premise of, you know, cat 
cataclysmon, this sort of calamity politics. I don't agree with it one little bit. I used to say it was a climate change religion because they call us deniers and you don't believe. But it's not a religion because even religions are challenged. This is a climate change cult. It's cultish type behaviour where it's unquestioned that they won't even co they won't even tolerate any form of dissent and you have to believe it, chapter, verse, in its entirety. And if you don't, you're a denier, you're a heretic, uh, you will be cancelled, you will be taken off social media. There will be no part of you shall be allowed to exist in the, pu in the public forum, in the public square. Uh, we're on, on our own behalf. We've got to say, no, no, we aren't going to act like that anymore. We're going to have sensible, open conversations which you which cogent arguments that are that are politely put from either side are listened to and tr treated with respect because when you get this cultish behavior that's when they put these massive wind factories off the coast of Wollongong and these massive wind factories off the coast of uh, Newcastle and in the New England and in central Queensland and in the Gippsland and up the Cape and take out rainforests to put them up and completely usurp farmers of their property rights and change people's lives because it's the following of a cult. Why this cultish behaviour is on their attention to the cost of living has completely and utterly been removed. I mean, we've got power prices going yep. through the roof, reliability going through the floor, your money going overseas, um, people with jobs living in cars, lined up outside food banks, um, they can't afford their house repayments, can't afford their small business repayments. And what does this government focus on? Climate action and constitutional change. That's that's where their heart really is. Uh, it's not with their people. Um, it's with, uh, you know, their, their issue du jour, their, their things that are so fanciful. And isn't it amazing that people who can't affect the cost of living can change the temperature of the globe. I, I find that a <laughs> remarkable, a remarkable yeah. trick. Uh, if they've got those superpowers, they can't even change the price of petrol. How about that? I can't believe it. Just finally, uh, Barnaby Joyce, yeah. the, uh, Albanese government's in all sorts of strife after the High Court forced it a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It was a High Court decision, but forced it to release... 141 people in immigration detention, including rapists, murderers and a pedophile. But what's on the government is that it hadn't prepared for this despite six months of warning, released them initially without any controls. It's been mortified, humiliated, but has now decided to turn the attack back on opposition Peter Dutton by, of all things, smearing him as a defender of pedophiles. Have a listen. The Home Affairs Minister has accused Peter Dutton of being a protector of pedophiles. Do you agree with that? Yes. It started a couple of years ago when Peter Dutton was the minister responsible and made a decision to allow NZYQ to apply for a visa instead of deporting him. And that set in train everything that's followed through to the court case, which has resulted in that High Court decision that we're scrambling to fix up All through right, Parliament so you now. Barnaby Joyce, Barnaby Joyce, what do you make of that outrageous. form of attack? That is outrageous. Yeah. A, a protector of pedophiles, what do you say to that? Yes. Uh, who, I, I didn't see who that clown was. But, uh, you know, this is... We would never say that about Annika any person Wells. in the Labor Party. You're a protector of pedophiles. Well, you, you're a clown, Annika. That's an outrageous thing to say. And if you've got any form of decency, you'll immediately apologise. Peter Dutton has spent so much of his political life trying to protect children being at the forefront of the protection of children, in the hunt for these, for these animals who live in the dark web near the, below the onion router, uh, abusing, killing, maiming children for sexual gratification. And Annika Ms. Wells says that he's a protector of pedophiles. This is, when you start talking like that, Annika, it means that your government is starting, is within sight of its last legs. When you start saying outrageous things such as that, it means that you are grasping for straws in an ocean of grief. And uh, you know, pull yourself up. I mean, it's just dopey. I mean, it's way off the field. That is not the... The, the, the political paddock is robust, but it is not dirty, and that is dirty. No, no, that is, that is dirty. That's, that's below the belt. Barnaby Joyce, thank you so much indeed for your time. Always a pleasure. Thank you.
Just a few hours ago, the truth, truce between Israel and the Hamas terrorists around Gaza was extended for a seventh day. Details yet aren't clear, but reports are that it's part of the original deal. For every 10 Jewish hostages that Hamas releases, Hamas will get 24 hours of truce and 30 Palestinian prisoners freed by Israel. Here are live pictures from Gaza. As you can see so far, no bombing or anything. It's peaceful, but Israel is adamant. As soon as Hamas stops producing more hostages, the war resumes. Hamas must be destroyed. Joining me is Jack Keane, retired four-star general, who serves as vice chief of staff of the United States Army, is now chairman of the Institute for the Study of War. General Keane, thank you so much for your time. The end of the truce, what do you expect to see well, frankly, uh, when the truth ends, I really expect to see the IDF get back into campaign operations. They, they were not completely cleared the northern Gaza area, but they had certainly did most of it. And frankly, uh, Hamas's leaders and most of their fighters have moved to the south. So our audience really has to understand, we are still, quite frankly, despite the weeks long uh, campaigns that have been conducted. We're in early stages of this campaign because the majority of the Hamas fighters are in the south and central uh, Gaza. And that's the reality of it. So much of the fighting that Israel has to do if their objective remains to dismantle Hamas is largely in front of them. And we estimate that there's somewhere be around 20,000 fighters that are left uh, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe five to 7,000 uh, that have been killed. These are estimates only. Uh, Hamas doesn't reveal any of their casualties. These largely come from where they, what the IDF thinks is happening. But I, I think they're somewhat in the ballpark, but it gives you a sense. There's a lot to be done to accomplish the objective of dismantling this network in terms of its military capability and eventually it, having it no longer govern uh, Gaza. Have you got any doubt about the ultimate objective of the IDF, that it has to keep going, that it has to destroy Hamas? In my mind, that's absolutely correct. Let's just make a couple of assumptions here. Let, let's assume um, that there was a permanent ceasefire uh, in the next week or so. If that occurred, Hamas would absolutely declare victory. Why is that? Their regime is intact, their leaders are intact, most of their fighters uh, are intact, and they dealt a very lethal blow uh, to Israel in terms of the number of people they killed, how they killed them, the butchery, the savagery, and what have they accomplished? Worldwide international condemnation of Israel, much more so than anything we've seen before. Second, considerably more geopolitical uh, isolation of Israel internationally. And third, weakened the government of Israel because it displayed that it could not protect its own people. So Hamas would declare victory. The international community would largely agree with them. Yes, I think uh, Israel has to keep going because uh, if it can't be loved and it's uh, not getting the love from the left in particular, at least it should be feared. So it needs to keep going. Otherwise, uh, Project Israel is in huge danger. With the hostages, though, there's been a release of a number of hostages, right? But probably, well, it's less than half. Uh, what is this war telling terrorists everywhere? To me, it seems to be taking hostages works because it's bought... Uh, Hamas, at least a, a, a week of, of truce now when it can, re, you know, gather itself and prepare uh, its defences. But what do you make of it? Yeah, absolutely. We've seen Iran take hostages for some time, and it's always uh, during peacetime competition, not during direct conflict, certainly. But taking wholesale hostages like this 
uh, during a conflict that, and actually in the early stages of it that Hamas has done. I think it has Iran's fingerprints all over it because Hamas has never really taken any casualties of consequence in the past. And it has a, had a huge payoff for them. It got them uh, a temporary ceasefire, if that's the case. And, and the reality is they've been able to refit, rearm, and relocate as a result of that. And as you indicated, less than half of the hostages uh, have, have, are, are only in the hands of Israel. Uh, the, the majority of them are still in the hands of Hamas and the other militant organizations. Look at Andrew, Hamas is going to hold on to a tranche of hostages towards the end. Why? Because they want to they want to preserve their regime. They want to preserve their leaders, and they want to negotiate Israel leaving Gaza. Uh, to get those hostages back so that regime will be preserved. Now, whether that is negotiated successfully or not remains to be seen. But believe me, that Hamas will put that on the table because that will still give them a strategic victory if Israel walks out of there and the regime is left uh, intact. Yeah, I said uh, less than half. I'm just in uh, calculating is probably about less than a third uh, two-thirds of the hostages are still in their hands. Just finally, uh, General, um, you were suggesting, you know, that Israel's uh, lost a lot, uh, diplomatically isolated uh, by, or increasingly. Can I just put to you a counter-proposition? There were concerns that the Hamas terrorist group could start a wider war with this, so they were certainly looking for support for that, hoping for that. Uh, you know, more Muslim countries uh, attacking Israel. That has not happened. Even uh, is, uh, Iran is, is, is doing it sort of under the, you know, sort of plausible denial and it's not really openly fighting Israel. Yemen is the only country that has. I'm just thinking that Hamas is increasingly isolated from the Arab world and that would be a totally good thing. Yeah, I think so. When you deal with the Arab countries themselves, not, not, the, not the proxies that Iran has in these countries, but the Arab nations themselves, you know, you know, two of them normalize relations, the UAE and Bahrain. They have embassies there, and they both condemned Hamas. Saudi Arabia, while it did not condemn Hamas, I know for a fact, because I've had three people that I know have been in Saudi Arabia since October the 7th, and they still intend to normalize relations with Israel. That is terrifically good news. They're going to obviously have to wait a certain amount of time before they do that. But Saudi Arabia looks at Hamas. Then think of the contrast. Hamas is trying to destroy the state of Israel, and Saudi Arabia is trying to have normal relations with it. They're absolutely opposed. You put your finger right on the difference that is happening now with the Arab states. And if Saudi Arabia normalizes relations, then all the other Arab and Muslim states in the region will do the same. Yes, Hamas has overplayed their hand, in, in my judgment, backed by the Iranians. Isn't it strange? You've got the disaffected left in your country and in mine, in Britain as well, throughout Europe, giving more comfort and support, in effect, to Hamas than the Arab leaders of the world are doing. I mean, I think that says something about how sick the parts of our culture have become. Uh, General Jack Keane, thank you so much indeed for your time. Yeah, great talking to you, Andrew, as always. After the break, more than 100 Australian journalists have signed an open letter proving they are a disgrace to the profession. I'll name and shame some of them after this. Last week, 165 Australian journalists issued the most shameful manifesto in Australian journalism. These journalists, many from the left-wing Guardian and the ABC, backed by the Journalist Union, signed this open letter demanding that, in effect, media outlets treat Israel as a genocidal state. These journalists ordered the media to give adequate coverage, in their view, to the supposed war crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing and apartheid of, well, they obviously meant Israel. Uh, not once did they attack Hamas like this, which is, in fact, genocidal. In fact, they demand the media treat Israel's leaders as no more trustworthy than those of Hamas. These 
lying Islamist terrorists, rapists, kidnappers and head hackers. As they put it, media outlets should apply as much professional scepticism when relying on uncorroborated Israeli government and military sources as is applied to Hamas. And they go on. Don't think this current war started with the October 7 massacre by Hamas of 1,200 Jews. Joining me is T Tony Thomas, journalist, former editor, quadrant columnist and author of many books. The latest, Anthem of the Unwoke. Tony, great to see you again. What kind of journalist? You've been in the business for many decades would sign such an anti-Israel and, in my opinion, effectively pro-Hamas letter. Where are they from? Well, it's just terrible. But when I began sampling them, I found that uh, <clears throat> the real majority are ed university educated. They've had three to five years at university. Most of them were doing... Uh, stupid journalism courses. Others, uh, surprisingly, were quite strong in the international relations sphere. And the other lot of the do-gooders, the yes campaigners, the uh, um, uh, global planet savers, uh, the um, people who think that they know uh, what everybody else should be doing. Well, then there's the cartoonists. There were four of Australia's prominent cartoonists signing. Uh, there's all the identity politics and the uh, um, uh, sorts of uh, people who uh, have no self-awareness. They, they uh, bang on about uh, uh, how journalists must uh, do the right thing and uh, they're advocating the worst possible form of journalism, uh, uh, bias. Uh, yeah, I noticed you used uh, the word do-gooders. How can you be a do-gooder? You do good and you find yourself... Uh, effectively helping, even if you don't mean to, some of the world's worst terrorists. I don't quite get it. Now, listen, um, tell us about some of the names. Uh, start with Karen Percy. Look, this is the thing. Most of these people I've never heard of, right? Uh, and almost none have right, listened sure. to any distinction in the media, apart from a couple of the cartoons. Tell us, uh, first of all, about her. Well, she's uh, the uh, leading light in the uh, uh, media section of the Media and Arts Alliance, and uh, she seems to be uh, 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 freelancing in her, in her private life. But uh, she's uh, uh, full of uh, self-virtue, uh, and uh, she's uh, leading the most awful campaign against true journalism. The other thing is that so many of these journalists are award winners and uh, prize getters. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite bizarre. And in addition, this Media and Arts Alliance is, is part of the uh, uh, Walkley Awards uh, cabal and it's also part of the press council that is supposed to be monitoring journalistic ethics. And yet uh, journalistic Ethics oh. are the first out the window. Uh, just by the way, you vastly underestimated the numbers here. Uh, it was 160. It immediately doubled to 300, uh, basically over the weekend. Oh, my God, But these no. petitions have... Yeah, oh, you've heard nothing yet, Andrew. These petitions have been uh, going since uh, 2021. Um, in uh, uh, October, uh, there was a petition by both the arty crowd and the journalistic crowd, and they had 1,700. Then there was a new petition by oh, the mate. MEAA, that's the Union, uh, Advocates for Palestine, that had 571. Um, and uh, the, the uh, numbers, uh, and apart from the ones that are like signing... <laughs> No, There's a, a, a section mean, at the bottom of, of some of these. On this uh, one. Uh, Tony, oh, yeah, that's just that's uh, 300. Time. I need to go through the some of them. Yeah. So we just talked about we just talked about a union official, right? A journalist union official. I mean, disgraceful back in this. Three of the signatories: the ABC's Tony Armstrong, the ABC's Jan Fran, the ABC's Benjamin Law, among others, are ABC. How does a taxpayer-funded ABC tolerate that when it's meant to be impartial? Well, they've got this anti-social media comment policy where, for example, Laura Tingle got uh, uh, um, rebuked for uh, talking about ideological bastardry of the coalition. Now, how is it any different if they're publicly naming themselves on the most grotesquely biased, hateful 
anti-Israel uh, petitions uh, by the hundred and the ABC won't even uh, di do any disciplining. And the real reason, I think, is that the MEAA is standing behind these journalists ready to take out strikes or, uh, in other words, uh, punish any employer who uh, dares to uh, take any retaliatory action against these journalists. So uh, it's... it's uh, uh, Lee, Lee Sales gave a talk, uh, her Andrew Ollie lecture about a month ago, and she admitted that uh, nobody trusts the media these days, and she even cited the fact that the ABC brand has tumbled from 5th to 18th Shit. in trust in the last two or three years. So it was a very good speech of hers, but she just said that... Uh, all journalists have to have the guts to face up to the fact that the public has had enough of them. The public is extremely sceptical of the when media. You see this, the public doesn't trust the media. And when you see this, they should be, Tony. They should be. Look, thank you very much. Uh, I urge people to read your full evisceration of this uh, uh, scandal on Quadrant Online. Thank you so much for your time. Tell you what, it was uh, odd how many cartoonists did sign this document. One name that struck me was David Rowe of the Financial Review. Once drew this cartoon of then Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, who was Jewish, uh, putting a, a, a Jewish kippah on his head, giving him a hook nose, an anti Jewish stereotype, of course, having him hold a big dollar sign. I mean, really, I'm not surprised this man signed uh, this uh, petition attacking Israel. Goodness me. After the break, our new regular commentator. The former spokesman of President Donald Trump on whether Trump has learned his lessons from the first time and whether the daughter of Indian immigrants might now catch him. Now to my new star regular guest. Could next year's American election race throw up a big surprise? At this stage, the choice seems certain between Democrat President Joe Biden now looking completely past it and former President Joe, uh, Donald Trump under a legal attack from Democrat prosecutors. But many Democrats are badly wanting Biden to bow out. And on the Republican side, Nikki Haley, former governor of South Carolina, former ambassador to the UN, has been rising in the polls from no hope to a distant second to Trump in some polls. And this week, a political action group founded by the mega billionaire Koch brothers has backed them in tens of millions of dollars of support, plus their oiled political machine. So next year it's going to be huge, which is why we've just signed up new weekly commentator Sean Spicer, who was White House spokesman for President Trump. And he joins me now. Sean Spicer, thank you for your time. How important is the support to Nikki Haley from the political network founded by the billionaire Koch brothers? Well, it's it, in a normal political cycle, it'd be extremely important. Uh, unfortunately, right now, you've got Ron DeSantis going into this first primary, it's a caucus state, Iowa, with the support of the governor and a very influential evangelical leader named Bob Vanderplatz. You're countering that with this big endorsement that Nikki Haley got from Americans for Prosperity, as you mentioned, this Koch-backed, uh, Charles and, and his brother-backed uh, uh, political action committee that's going to put a lot of money, not just in ads, but on door knocking, on turning out the vote. And so the thing is, because they're splitting this, right? You've got DeSantis getting some key endorsements, Nikki Haley getting some key endorsements, and then Trump still sitting anywhere between 40% in the state of Iowa to 50, 55 nationally. It's going to be very hard to, to break out. And that's what I think the challenge is for anyone who's trying to challenge Trump right now. It seems, uh, yes, an absolute race to be second, but only second uh, between the other right. candidates. And, and talking of that, you mentioned uh, Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor. I mean, isn't this the strangest debate in this strange campaign will be to, tomorrow when he, who's way behind Trump in the polls, as you say, will debate California Governor Gavin Newsom, who himself, we don't even know if he's going to replace President Joe Biden as the Democrat candidate. And they're going to have a one-on-one -on -one televised debate. What will that prove? You know, Andrew, it's a great question because I think that the timing is off. If 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 DeSantis and Newsom had had this debate earlier and DeSantis could show that he was able to take on a Democrat and be that fighter uh, that, you know, not only could be Trump, but could take on Biden or whomever the Democrats put up, I think it would have benefited him better. But they lagged on in the negotiations and weren't able to settle on a date until, as you mentioned, what will be tomorrow uh, in Georgia on a Fox program. 
I think it's important. But remember, I just don't I don't know how many people are going to look to that as is somewhat insightful to how they'll vote in Iowa or New Hampshire. And, and just to be clear on this, Ron DeSantis has taken all of his chips, if you will, and put them on Iowa. If he doesn't come out a strong second place, his race is over. There's no way about it that he doesn't. He has made it very clear that Iowa is where he's planting his flag and that he shows that he can be the formidable number two uh, candidate to Donald Trump to get into that one-on-one -on -one race. If Nikki Haley bests him in Iowa or, or you know, they tie, I just don't see how DeSantis has the ability to go to grassroots supporters or donors and make the case that he should continue. Well, especially when the air seems to have been going out of his balloon for quite a while now. That's right. Uh, look, Sean Spice, it's the first time I've been able to uh, talk to you. Uh, I'm interested that Donald Trump that we see campaigning now compared to the Donald Trump that you worked for in the White House, have you noticed any change? Do you think he'd become, be a different president than he was the first time around? I do. I think he learned a lot the first time, as would any first timer into politics. Look, we put together, I went with him on day one into the White House. There was a, there was a bunch of folks that had no ex political experience. They were from different political backgrounds. Um, and that was who Donald Trump was. And I get it. But I think he learned a lot about the people that he needs to surround himself with, the challenges that the federal government poses in terms of trying to reform it, and and the, the qualities and experience of the people that you need to do the job. The first you know year, I think there was a steep learning curve. He walks in now with four years of hindsight and the ability to start on day one in a way that most presidents wouldn't have. But the difference with Trump is that on Republican and Democratic sides, you've always had people that have been in politics. They've been a governor, a senator. They have a deep bench of people to call upon to staff the government when they take over. Trump didn't have that. And as you know, we weren't expected to win. So there wasn't a ton of planning put into it. We kind of went, you know, hit the, hit the gas pedal right after the election. And I think we did a great job hitting the ground running. But I don't think that it was the best group of people who really understood what President Trump's priorities were and what the mission was. And now you see a lot of spade work being done by groups uh, here in the United States that that are on the Republican side that are being that want to make sure that Trump or any other administration is staffed up day one with the right people. And they're creating and cataloging resumes of people who are qualified and who support the cause. It's a shame that he's uh, burnt some of the more capable uh, performers in his last administration. I thought Mike Pompeo was uh, was actually a great asset uh, in the end. Well, I, I would state. say, Andrew, I think that Mike um, Pompeo is somebody who I could see coming back into a second Trump term. In fact, he's sort of my dark horse, if you will, on the on the vice president's list. I think the president and Secretary Pompeo have a good working relationship. They know each other. They understand the agenda. I mean, Secretary Pompeo is one of the few people at the senior levels who lasted all four years. He's very capable. He's a very brilliant man. And I think he understands the America First agenda and understands President Donald Trump. And Donald Trump has a tremendous amount of respect for him. Thank you so much indeed for your time, Sean Spicer. You bet, Andrew. Thank you for having me. After the break, the federal government pays these two people $125,000 to teach public servants how to properly pay respects to the traditional owners. But why? One's even an American, for goodness sake. Now, oh, see, the federal government's still addicted to this divisive ritual of acknowledgement to country, respects to elders past, present and emerging, and has spent $125,000 on a company run by two, these two people to teach public servants how to say it properly. But even more farcical is that one of these experts is actually American and the other, well, yes, he does have Aboriginal ancestry, identifies as Aboriginal, but judging by his parents and his grandparents, also has plenty of European and other ancestry as well. So who really should be acknowledging who and why even bother? Joining me is Sky News presenter James McPherson of The Late Debate here on Sky at 10pm and Evelyn Ray, writer and Sky News contributor. 
James, is there a point to acknowledgement of country? Well, the seductive charms of welcome to country and acknowledgement of country, Andrew, are twofold. For a small group of non-Indigenous people, it enables them to feel like they are good people. It assuages the guilt that they have. For a small group of Indigenous people, it allows them to feel special and they like that special status. But for the majority of Australians, we don't have a problem with acknowledgement of country. It's a historical fact that Indigenous people were here first. What we object to is facts of history being used to divide us in the present. I think that's the objection that most people have. Evelyn, I, my, I go a bit further than that because I really don't like dividing this country who came here first and who really owns it. What, what do you think about all this? Look, it's obviously a rot. <laughs> I think the continual insistence on issuing welcome to country in every situation is actually an offence to the Australians who built this country from their backbones. Um, I think it's very un-Australian. I think it's very divisive. And I don't welcome you to your own house because you belong there. How out of place would it be for me to welcome you to your own home? And that is effectively what we are reinforcing every time we have to welcome Australians to Australia. What they are essentially saying is you don't belong here and here is your hourly reminder. I have a feeling that increasingly more people are going to get upset with this the longer we go on and the more we intermarry anyway. James Henry Kissinger has just died. The news came today, aged 100. He fled to America as a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany, became an academic, legendary Secretary of State under US President Richard Nixon, paving the way for, of course, Nixon's breakthrough visit to communist China, and won a Nobel Peace Prize for ending the war in Vietnam. And he was almost also very famous for his voice. Have a listen. And there's nothing in private life you can do that's as interesting and as fulfilling. Does Kissinger, or did he, impress you, James? Yeah, he does impress me, Andrew, three ways. Firstly, he was a, a giant intellect. You compare him with some of the politicians leading nations around the world right now, and he's head and shoulders above them in his capacity to think things through and articulate them. He was incredibly witty, he had the gift of the gab, and even at the age of 100, still was as sharp as a tack, and uh, his capacity was quite remarkable. You compare the 100-year-old Henry Kissinger still giving interviews as recently as weeks ago with the current leader of the United States, and uh, he was a giant of a man. Some loved him, some did not like him, but you couldn't deny his wit, his intellect, and his capacity puts most leaders today to shame. I've got to say, I'm running out of time, Evelyn. We're a bit short to, tonight, but I, I want to ask you about... Australia's now become infamous internationally for two instances now of monstering Jews. The first, of course, our crowd outside the Sydney Opera House screaming, gas the Jews. The second now, protesters are storming a Melbourne hotel to chant slogans and intimidate Jews from Israel who are actually there to talk about their own relatives who have been kidnapped and killed by Islamist terrorists. What do you make of all this? Yeah, look, number one, a hotel is a private property. And number two, why didn't the police remove them from said private property? Hotels yes. have terms and conditions. They have contracts. Surely uh, unpaid guests or members of the public coming in and protesting to paid guests goes against those terms and conditions and the contracts. Look, if Palestinians want sympathy, this is the wrong way going about it. Everybody has the right to protest for innocent lives, but you only have to look at the foot Footage of the blood on the babies being thrown and all of that to go this is a little bit more than than those sorts of things they're shooting themselves in the foot while ever they continue protesting in these ways I mean do we want Middle Eastern wars fought on Australian soil between Australians because there are ways to communicate your message and this is certainly a very un-Australian way about it yeah, and all that coward's masks on as well, like they're real fighters but can't be identified. But, James, I found it disgusting that at the police station that night were Jews from the Israel yeah. looking for, for safety instead of the people that were terrorising them in the hotel. Why weren't they arrested? Why didn't the police go for them?
Andrew, do you remember in October in Dagestan, in uh, Soviet-controlled or Russian-controlled territory, there was a, a mob who heard that Correct. there were some Jews at an airport and they stormed the runway trying to find the Jews. Then they heard some Jews were at a hotel. They stormed the hotel. I remember watching that, being horrified, thinking, thank God I don't live in a country like that, only to wake up this morning and find I do. You are so right. I'd forgotten that. That's absolutely correct. But Evelyn, what are these people thinking? I mean, have they no shame? I don't, I don't quite get how we have produced these people. Well, I think that they're a product of, um, you know, a, a war of information. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have. The internet has been such a blessing, but also such a curse. And so you have people from very young ages being indoctrinated to believe certain things, especially young people. They're so easily impressionable and exploited. And unfortunately, when you import people, they're, most of the time, they are loyal to their mother nation, not the nation yep. they've emigrated to. And I think that's that's what we're seeing. Correct. James and First and Evelyn Ray, thank you so much for, to you both. That's it from me. Coming up now, Chris Kenny tonight. Good night.